To the listeners and viewers, we welcome you back to our channel we call Prepare to Meet the God. This is a program made to study the truth about the words of God without any hint of human interpretation to lead us to a right understanding of the words of God that will become the instruction that we will use in order to prepare ourselves for the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We will be beginning a new series in which we will be talking about the grace of God and its relevance to the law that he uses as the requirement for our salvation. There is a great misconception about the grace of God that the people preach to others in which they say that this grace is the power that works our salvation without anything on our part to do for us to enter heaven. This is the first of the Law and Grace series and let us begin our study with a prayer. Let us pray. Our dear and loving Heavenly Father, we come before you to thank you for the manifold blessings you have given to your people by opening to us another opportunity to learn your words. As we try to understand the mysteries of your grace and of your great wisdom, we invite the presence of your Holy Spirit to be with us, to guide us into a right understanding of the truth. Only bless this channel and the people that are listening to your words, that it may become a fruitful endeavor to change our lives for good. May thou forgive us from the sins that we have made against thee in our words, thoughts, and acts. And all these things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Let us begin our discussion about the grace of God. The grace of God places a most significant role in our lives. Every good deed that we do and every right thing that springs up from our life is due to the grace of God. It guides us and it leads us into a right understanding and it is the gift, the power, and the help that springs from our God that He bestows to the people in this world to bring about good and lead us into eternal life. We owe everything to God's free grace. Grace in the covenant ordained our adoption. Grace in the Savior effected our redemption, our regeneration, and our exaltation to heirship with Christ. Not because we first loved Him did God love us, but while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We should never have learned the meaning of the word grace had we not fallen. God loves the sinless angels who do His service and are obedient to His commandments, but He does not give them grace. These heavenly beings know not of grace. They have never needed it, for they have never sinned. Grace is an attribute of God shown to undeserving human beings. We ourselves did not seek after it, but it was sent out in search of us. God rejoices to bestow this grace upon all who hunger for it, not because we are worthy, but because we are so utterly unworthy. It is only through the unmerited grace of Christ that any man can find entrance into the city of God. However, we put ourselves in peril if we come to a false understanding of the grace of God, especially in thinking that the grace of God has nothing to do with the law of our God, which is preached in the whole world. Now, let us begin reading in the book of Titus chapter 2 verse 11, saying, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Now, this grace of God that brings salvation to the whole world has appeared to all men. And the world now teaches a misconception about this very text. They say that grace alone is needed for us to be saved. And there is no law that is needed anymore for the people of this world to come closer to our God and for us to ultimately, at the end of the days, be with Him in the heavenly courts above. But this grace that they have taught, we must understand completely in the light of the words of God, which will teach us the truth of how the grace of God works in our lives. We continue in Titus chapter 3, verse 3 to 7. It says here, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This grace that God bestows upon you and upon me is the form of God's mercy that he gave in order to save us. And this grace, according to what we have learned, is something that rose into greater necessity because of sin. 
And there is not a single man in earth that has no need of the grace of God. For the mercy of God or the grace of God is bestowed for our salvation. And it is salvation from our sins. There is not a single man on earth who would claim that he has not sinned. We all know a thing or two about sin. And I know that I have committed sin, and you are aware as well, my brethren, of that. And so that is written as well in the book of Romans chapter 3, verse 23, saying there, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The first of God's creation, our first parents, lost the glory of God, even the immortality that comes with it. And that is because of sin. And not only to them, but even as we have sinned against the law of God and against our God himself, we also, and the entirety of humanity, have come short of the glory of God. Having sinned against the law of God and against God, our offense against God and his law will only reap life as a payment for it, for us to be forgiven. However, the value of man's life is incomparable to the value of the offense that we have made. If we were to sacrifice our lives, it will not be able to redeem us from the transgression that we have done. No. That is why as humanity transgressed against God, it took one equal with God himself to become of equal value to redeem the fallen race from our impending doom. We read in Romans chapter 6 verse 23 saying, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is through Christ that we are redeemed from our sins and the death that awaits us because of our transgression. That is why in the sorrowful story of the fall of men, it was then that they were found transgressing against our Lord that caused them to suffer the same penalty, stripped of the glory of God and there necessitates the mercy of God for us. The enemy of God's kingdom has not stopped to lure souls into temptation and ruin. Even in deceiving our minds into false understandings that will lead us to false paths. And ever since his fall, it has been his work to bring souls into transgression against our God by his deceptions. It says here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. In his great deception, our first parents fell in sin. Written in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14, saying, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman, being deceived, was in the transgression. And that transgression has only one definition in the Bible, here in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, saying, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. However, in the great love of God, this is what was given to us in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, saying, For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. God has gifted us his redeeming and saving grace. And this is his great love that he has given to all of humanity indiscriminately. God does not look at the righteous deeds that we have done, that we are seen by him as worthy to receive his grace. But it is purely through the merit of Christ. All of us may cling to this hope and in faith take hold of God's grace that will save us. But we must be careful in how we take hold in faith of this grace given to us by God. For we may be taking hold of it, but taking hold of it in a blind fashion, not discerning how the grace of God works. Now, the world today in the different denominations explain to us that during the time that the New Testament and even during this very present day preach to us that we are now living in the generation of the dispensation of grace. That goes to say that our day and age have nothing to do with the law, but rather it is the grace of God and the grace of God alone that will save us with nothing else to come from our part. There is nothing left for us to do but to wait for his salvation. That is what they teach. And on the other hand, they preach that the Old Testament times were the days when they lived under the dispensation of the law of God. But when the law was fulfilled, which they mean to say that Christ has obeyed the law and that there remains no necessity for us to obey the law of God, the law ceased to exist. And the people was to entirely depend upon the dispensation of grace that began in the New Testament era. In order to take hold of the true meaning of the grace of God, we must correct these false doctrines and false teachings that rather lead us away from God instead of drawing nearer to him. We must not blindly take hold of the grace of God, not discerning what it is, for it has everything to do with our present and eternal reality. Now to prove that this so-called dispensation of grace did not exist and begin in the New Testament, let us read in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9 saying, 
who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. The grace of God existed before the New Testament. The grace of God was already there during the time that the first sin was committed against God. There was no time when the law had its effect and a time when the grace of God also had its time to take effect. No, the law of God and the grace of God are two things that come inseparable. Iniquity was found in men because of the law of God. And the grace of God came to us unconditionally in order to save us from our sins. There was no merit in us that allowed for us to take hold of the grace of God as our right because of our own doings. No, but continuing in Romans chapter 5 verse 20, it said there, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. The existence of grace, the kindness, and the mercy of God is something that existed long ago. There was no specific time that we can allot that the grace of God began to exist, but rather it began to abound during the time that sin was discovered and met with justice. Because of sin, the law abounded. But as sin abounded, grace did much more abound, for it is this grace that God has given to save us from our sins. And with that alone, God proves to us that the existence of the law, which is as timeless as God himself, is together with the existence of the grace of God. Although the law was made prominent, for it was made use to identify what sin was, for by the law is the knowledge of sin, grace as well was made prominent during the time when man had its greatest need of it in order to return to the hands of God and be saved. So it is a false teaching and a false doctrine to say that there had been two separate dispensations that lead us to divide the law from the grace of God. However, they are heavily interwoven. They coexisted and are inseparable from one another. And the moment that sin was discovered, the law and the grace of God abounded. Not that they began to exist, but they were put into the spotlight for they were the great matters that revolved around identifying sin and saving us from our sins. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, it says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. In the moment of man's weakness, the grace of God was the one that entirely supplemented the strength that we need in order to overcome the hour of trial. And so from the moment of man's weakness, the grace of God, the power of Christ, existed to become our sufficient help and our strength. That is why it is also said that here in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, it says, Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The grace of God did not begin to exist by the time that Christ was manifest in the flesh. No, but rather, as the text goes, it was during the time that the Savior of this world was made flesh that we saw this grace. We understood, we witnessed this grace in abundance through the life of Christ. To further understand the grace of God, let us read further in Romans chapter 5, verse 12 to 15, saying, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God, and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many. The grace of God came to abound in this world through Jesus Christ, and it is called a free gift. It is a free gift and given to us unconditionally by God. However, my brethren, we must put this into mind very clearly. For this grace to take effect in our lives, we have something that we need to do on our part. When we are recipients of the grace of God, it is not at all times that it is received fruitfully. It could be received in vain. The process of receiving this free gift of God needs an effort on our side. 
And for this gift to become useful and to take effect in our lives, there we have something that we need to do in response to receiving this grace that comes from Christ. For he is the source of grace, according to John chapter 1, verse 14, saying, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. However, contrary to thinking that it was during the time that Christ was made into man that grace began, it was not. Christ our God is the source of this grace. It was only through his great sacrifice, becoming human, to repair the channel between the human and the divine, that we beheld this great grace. But to talk about existence per se, as Christ existed long before and as God has pre-existence, so was his grace. And this grace is what we desperately need should we choose to become acquainted with our God and becoming heirs of eternal life. The moment that man was in need of saving, God's saving grace did abound. But this grace that will save is like the plan of salvation itself. It was appointed before the world began. It was there. There never was a time in the Bible that there has been a separation between the law of God and the grace of God by dividing it as the dispensation of the law and the dispensation of grace. No, there was never. We add here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 to 20, saying, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. God's salvation was manifested in the last times when Christ was with us. However, that salvation was already ongoing the moment that man needed salvation. The plan of salvation existed before the foundations of the world. And so was his grace. It coexisted together with the law. Now, we read here in Revelation 13, verse 8, saying, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. God has dispensed his grace, not in the New Testament, but it was for all ages to take hold on in order to secure for themselves the salvation that God has promised to them who needed saving. Christ did not begin the plan of salvation and he did not dispense of his grace during the time that he became man. But our Savior, the King of all creation, made his sacrifice for mankind the moment we needed saving. Our sins have caused the law of God to work for our condemnation. And as sin abounded, grace did much more abound. This is the true dispensation of grace. As we have debunked the false understanding of the world that there were separate ages when the law of God was in effect and a separate time that the grace of God was also in effect, in the next discussion that we will have, we will be learning about how the law of God and His grace are inseparable. That as the grace of God that brings salvation is needed, the keeping of the law is the way for us to take hold of that grace and for it to take effect in our lives. Let us end our study with a prayer. Our Father in heaven, in this quiet hour, we humbly come before you in thanks and gratitude for the understanding that you have given us of the truth of your grace and how it began to abound when the world needed saving. As we continue to learn about the truth of your law and your grace and erase from our minds the false understanding of grace from the people of this world, help us only to take hold of this grace and live a life that walks in accordance to your law for us to be found righteous in your sight at your second coming. We only ask forgiveness for the sins that we have made against thee, and all these things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Right now, God is calling for his people who truly love him and will show this love to him by the obedience of his laws and his Ten Commandments, and also with the true conception of the grace of God. And he is calling you the same. If you feel the need to know more, feel free to contact us through these platforms and continue to learn the scriptures and share these to your friends and your family so that all of us will be blessed by God's words. And may God's blessing be upon you.